And it's interesting to me why Durer would choose the theme of the apocalypse at the end of the 15th century. Uh, because the apocalypse, as we'll see, is a text that comes out of intense persecution. And whatever you want to say about the 15th century, it was not a time of intense persecution. Uh, so why is it that he picked this theme, and especially to have all of these huge folio plates illustrating the apocalypse, it's really a puzzle. And so what I want to talk about is both what that reflects about what he's doing, and also what it contributes to future development. So I'll be looking past 1511 to things that happen very shortly after that. Um, now the scholars have pointed out that one reason uh, that people were interested in the apocalypse during this time was the round number that came up, 1500. And like Y2K, if you're old enough to remember Y2K, it seems very ancient now. Anytime human beings hit round numbers like that, like 1500, the world's going to happen. Luckily, we survived the Mayan calendar. That was another one. So again, America being very apocalyptic place. <laughs> so, so part of it was the year 1500. Part of it was the pervasiveness of black death and the plague. It was just wiping people out all over the place. There were cosmic signs like meteors and comets that were occurring that reminded people that the end might be coming. Um, and it seems to me also the Nuremberg Chronicle, which, which basically documents the history of the world up until that present moment, could very well have contributed to that, because that would be the capstone of the story, right? We all want to believe that the whole story of humanity ends with us. You know? <laughs> so, so in a way, that, that sense of history and its development may have contributed to this as well. Um, it's very, very hard to say, but the publication of the text, and especially these gripping images, uh, not only reflects interest in the apocalypse, but I think it was a major contributing factor to why Germany in the 16th century is so interested in the apocalypse. Because he basically publishes an illustrated, I mean majorly illustrated, book of the apocalypse and publishes it on its own. So it's not part of the huge Bible, it's the apocalypse. And it's in German and Latin, which means learned people as well as lay people who can read German have access. Uh, now, Durer, we know, was very skilled in marketing, and this, this book was an enormous success. Uh, by 1502, I think it is, it's being pirated, just like things are in uh, China and elsewhere today. Um, and so he actually uh, reissues a new edition in 1511, and at the, end of, uh, at the end of each folio, I think, he says, and by the way, this is protected by Emperor Maximilian I's <laughs> edict, and so you can't reprint this without his permission. Um, and we'll talk about that, actually. why he presents the themes that he does and why he leaves other themes out. So what I want to talk about mainly then is what, what is apocalypse? You know, this book is called the apocalypse. Where does apocalyptic thinking come from? How does Durer interpret the apocalypse? And what does he leave out? And part of what's going to happen is what he leaves out comes in in a huge way, even in his own life. So that's, that's sort of the direction I'm going. Um, Apocalyptic thought basically comes from the uh, Greek word apocalypse, apocalypto, uh, which is to reveal, it's to unveil, actually. And it comes especially in the book of Daniel, about which I'll speak uh, now. In the book of Daniel, God is the revealer of mysteries. So you have a mystery, and then God reveals the mystery. Interestingly, these images are actually mysteries. And John doesn't know what they mean. I think it's very interesting that Durer, you know, portrays these things as though you could just look at it and see what it means. But we have no idea, you know, John doesn't know what they mean when he sees them. And so an angel has to come and reveal it to him. So, so, so an apocalypse is a revelation in a mystery. It's the revelation of a mystery. But the first revelation is this mystery. And then an angel, usually, is the one who comes and interprets the mystery to you and unveils it to you. And the mystery is the end of the world. So that, that part of apocalyptic thinking is, uh, is very clear. It's also clear that Christian apocalyptic actually has its roots in Jewish apocalyptic during the Second Temple period. Uh, the Jewish community underwent a horrific persecution around the year 165 before the Common Era by a Seleucid ruler after Alexander the Great died, a Seleucid ruler named, named Antiochus IV Epiphanes. And Antiochus IV Epiphanes, Epiphanes means God manifests. So he had a very low opinion of himself. Because <laughs> an epiphany is when God appears to you. So he is God manifest. And we'll see this theme as we talk about today, too. Uh, and he is for epiphanies <laughs> made a major contribution to Jerusalem by seeking to eliminate during this period the distinctiveness of the Jews. So on the one hand, he wants to defile the temple in Jerusalem so that no one can offer sacrifices there to Yahweh anymore. And on the other hand, he wants the Jews to knock off their irritating practices like not eating all the food Gentiles eat, circumcising their children on the eighth day, etc. And so he, you 
institutes uh, a defilement, an official defilement of the temple in Jerusalem. He goes in and installs a statue of Zeus where the Holy of Holies is, and then offers pigs in sacrifice, which are defiled, uh, unclean food, offers pigs as sacrifice to Zeus in the temple in Jerusalem. So during this period, sacrifice in the temple stops. Um, and it's in this awful tragedy. And also during this period, women who circumcised their infants had this infant strangled to death, hung around their necks. They were paraded around the wall of Jerusalem, and they were thrown to their death. Uh, people who refused to eat meat sacrificed to the idols of Rome uh, were killed. Right? And so we had torture. In fact, they're tortured in a way very similar to the way Guru uh, represents John being tortured. They were, they were put in a uh, pan, and they were fried alive. So, so this, so, so the apocalyptic vision comes out of this kind of situation, where you have a ruler of extraordinary arrogance, who thinks that he's God, who thinks he commands the wind and the sea, who thinks that you know, he can walk on water. This is actually what uh, Jews say about him, and, and who, who corrupts in a fundamental way the worship of the Lord, right? And the thought was, this is intolerable. God will not be able to take this anymore. God has to intervene and bring history to an end. Right? No more rise and fall of empires. No more, oh, it's Antiochus this time, it's going to be Babylon next time, it's going to be so and so. No, this is it. We've had it. God's had it. God's sending the Son of Man to smash this arrogant SOB once and for all and give the kingdom of God to the righteous Jews who have suffered under him. Right? So apocalyptic thinking in this moment needs a really bad guy. It needs an arrogant person who's right in the heart of worship, messing it up. Right? And it also needs people who are suffering persecution under the hand of this arrogant person. And that's the trigger for God in heaven to see this and to act decisively. And I mean like really decisively. It's not just Pharaoh and his army thrown into the Red Sea. It's all of that stuff just gone. They're gone forever. And then the kingdom of God will come. Uh, in its place. Um, so, so that's the background, and this theme, this obviously didn't happen in 165 before the Common Era, but uh, Jesus and the apostles are absolutely saturated with this vision in their own day. So when Jesus says the kingdom of God is at hand, repent and believe in the gospel, the kingdom of God about which he's preaching, I think, is basically Daniel's vision. And then the question is, what is the kingdom that's going to be smashed when that kingdom comes? Um, so, so, and, and uh, the New Testament clearly in the Gospels portrays Jesus as the Son of Man who will come with all authority in his hand. And at the end of Matthew, it says, All authority in heaven and earth is bigger than me. He's basically telling you, I'm the Son of Man. Right? So, so Jesus is portrayed not as the Son of Man during his lifetime uh, in that way. He, he obviously is crucified by Rome at the hands of the Jews or with the cooperation of the Jews. But he will come again. And when he comes again, he will be the Son of Man. And when he comes again, he will judge those who persecute his followers, and he will vindicate his followers against their persecutors. Right? So it's the same model, only now you have the Son of Man being identified as Jesus, which he is also in uh, John's Apocalypse. The other thing that, that happens with regard to the New Testament, which is a new thing, is who the arrogant one is. Um, and, and in part we'll see that the arrogant one is, in fact, still an empire to Rome. John's vision. But there's also in the epistles the thought that the arrogant one is one that they call the lawless one or the antichrist. And so there's going to be one who appears in the temple who is a figure we, we don't see in Daniel, but who will trigger the end of time. Right? So you need the arrogant lawless one persecuting the believers right out of the heart of worship uh, in order for this apocalyptic thought to work. Uh, in the Second Thessalonians chapter 2, uh, the Pauline author says, As to the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ that are being gathered together to him, we beg you, brothers and sisters, not to be quickly shaken in mind or alarm, either by spirit or by word or by letter, uh, as though from us to the effect of that the day of the Lord is already here. So it's not here again. Let no one deceive you in any way, for that day will not come unless the rebellion comes first and the lawless one is revealed to have to have the lawless one from the end to come. Okay? He opposes and exalts himself above every so-called God or object of worship, so that he 
takes his seat in the temple of God, declaring himself to be God. So you kind of that Antiochus Epiphanes thing. So, so I think that's really important. The end will not come until the lawless one appears and, and appears in the place of worship. The Apocalypse of John, which Durer is illustrating here, comes right out of that context. Uh, it's been very much debated who the Lord of Babylon is. She's down there. Uh, I think Durer thinks it's Jerusalem, actually, earthly Jerusalem. Um, scholars are pretty much unanimous now it's Rome. Uh, and Durer may not be able to think it's Rome because his patron is the Holy Roman Emperor. <laughs> Fatally, I think, compromises it. But that's another, that's another story. Uh, whereas the New Testament Gospels tend to focus on the destruction of Jerusalem, for instance, in Luke, as being the apocalyptic judgment on the, faith, the faithlessness of the Jews, the apocalypse of John uh, focuses very much on Rome as the Arab uh, and they And they call Rome Babylon, or John calls Rome Babylon. That's code. You wouldn't say Rome, right? Um, and so the, the, the apocalypse focuses on the destruction of Rome for arrogantly destroying Jerusalem and the temple instead of defiling the temple the way Antiochus did, the Romans destroy it in 70 of the common era. And they persecute the Jews, the faithful Jews, and also that and the followers of Jesus. So you have the arrogance, you have the destroying the place of worship, and then you have the violence against the God all wrapped up. And that's what John is basically talking about. Moreover, you have Roman emperors calling themselves the Son of God. In fact, the title, the Son of God, is a Roman imperial term. Right? So when the New Testament calls Jesus the Son of God, they're saying he's the Son of God, not Caesar. That's a Caesar term. It's really interesting. So, so John's apocalypse knows that. So it's playing uh, Rome off against the followers of Jesus. Um, and the culminating scene, then, is when the faithful who have, who have lived through this persecution by Rome and its arrogance uh, are vindicated by the return of Jesus, the Son of Man, uh, and inherit the glory of God in the kingdom. And Rome is therefore destroyed uh, and cast into this place where they will suffer endlessly but can never die. It's really this risen scene where you're, just, you're tormented and you want to die and you can't. Um, so, uh, so the apocalypse ends, interestingly enough, before the new Jerusalem comes down from heaven, Rome must be hurled into the abyss. Right? And they even sing a hymn in chapter 18 and chapter 19 about the, the Babylon has fallen and Babylon is Rome. Okay? So, so the destruction of Rome precedes the descent of the heaven of Jerusalem. Now with the publication of the apocalypse by Durer, uh, with full page woodcuts, which is, uh, to my mind, is, I'm not an art historian, nor do I play one on TV, but, uh, but and I didn't say at the Holiday Inn Express last night either, no? but, anyway, <laughs> but he gives full page illustrations, whereas if you look at X Bible, the German Bible there, or the Nuremberg Chronicle, they illustrate the woodcuts were always implanted in the text. He actually devotes the entire page to the woodcut. And so more than just illustrating a, a manuscript, these are interpretations of the manuscript. He's highlighting events in the apocalypse he wants the reader to focus on. And so I really do have, I think this is as much a commentary as anything. Because why these events? And then ask yourself the other question, why not other events? Right? So, so with the publication of the apocalypse, Durer is giving an interpretation of the end by means of what he does and does not illustrate. Uh, and these are, there are a lot of illustrations, so he could have done any number of things. So asking what he's highlighting is really, I think, important when you look at these and what he's not highlighting. So reading the book of Revelation before you look at these actually is really interesting because you can see it's very selective what he's doing. What he highlights, I think, and I tend to agree with the scholars I looked at who said this, he highlights the heavenly glory, the scenes of heavenly glory of the John Potnos scenes, which is in striking contrast to his, his experience on Potnos being tortured by Rome. Right? So he's, God allows him to see a vision of the future, this magnificent glory of God and the saints uh, who are vindicated by the Lamb and their triumph and finally ending with the descent of the New Jerusalem in which there will be no temple because God will dwell in the midst of the city. It's an amazing vision. And that, it seems to me, is pretty much Durer's focus is on what's coming, the good thing that's coming. But what's lacking is the oppressor. What's lacking is 
Antiochus for Epiphanes, or the or, or Rome. Okay, what's lacking is the one exalting himself to the place of God, corrupting the worship of God, and persecuting the followers. I mean, you could have down being tortured, but you're not quite sure why. You look at that window, and that, and that theme pretty much drops away. Um, so he's highlighting, though, by publishing this, he's highlighting the fact that the end is coming, right? And he's highlighting interest in the end coming. But he's also raising a profound question, and that is, how can the end come unless the arrogant one comes? Like, if he's right, that the end is really coming, before we should be thinking the end is really coming, who is the arrogant one? Who is the persecutor? Who is the one who is exalting himself in the temple, claiming to be God? Who is the one corrupting the worship of God in the very heart of the temple? You can't read the Apocalypse of John in light of the New Testament, in light of Daniel, without asking that question. You know, the author of 2 Thessalonians says, the end will not come until the arrogant one shows up in the place of worship, right? So, so what Durer actually, I think, contributes to by the absence of that theme here is the search for that one. If the end is really coming, then the lawless one must be here, right? Within 10 years, 10 years, Durer is convinced that Martin Luther has identified that person and is the Bishop of Rome. Okay, the Bishop of Rome has exalted himself as God in the temple of God and has fundamentally, this is Luther's point, corrupted the worship of God and oppressed believers by forcing on their consciences laws that he made up. That God doesn't require of us. And by taking away from Christians the forgiveness of sin, the consolation of the gospel. Right? So the usurper, the arrogant one, the beast, the monster, the oppressor is the bishop of Rome. And he must be destroyed. Okay? So Luther's not a reformer. Luther's the last call. If Luther's right, there's no church to reform. God's got to come destroy Rome and then bring the heavenly Jerusalem, right? So Luther is kind of your last call before the end comes. And Durer, when Luther is hidden away in 1521, uh, he writes this amazing statement where he basically identifies the gospel Luther preached with the, with the new Jerusalem. He says, he thinks, he thinks Luther is dead and he asks if God can actually bring him back to life again so that somebody can preach this uh, to the people. And then he says, as thou, oh my God, this is a lament he writes, uh, ordainest that after, uh, thereafter that Jerusalem should be destroyed for that sin. Now notice how he doesn't say Rome should be destroyed for that sin, but he calls it Jerusalem. So wilt thou also destroy the self-assumed authority of the sea of Rome. So he would say that John of Patmos is probably talking about Jerusalem being destroyed, but he's talking about Rome being destroyed, the sea of Rome being destroyed. O Lord, give us then the new beautiful Jerusalem, which descends out of heaven, whereof the apocalypse writes. What is that, Jerusalem? The holy, pure gospel, which is not darkened by human teaching. May everyone who reads Dr. Luther's book see how clear and transparent his teaching is when he sets forth the holy gospel. So I think that's amazing. He not only poses the question, what one point be, but when Luther identifies him as the Bishop of Rome, Durer agrees with him. And then he's absolutely feels lost at sea when Luther is absconded away and hidden in the dark of the castle and they thought he thought he was actually dead. Okay? So Durer would be on the side of those in, in Germany who see the godless one, the arrogant one, uh, who's, who's the trigger for the end day as being the Bishop of Rome. <coughs> and that's going to be 10 years of this edition being published. But that's hardly the end of the story in Germany. Okay, 13 years after this edition is published, Two years after Luther appears in the Diet of Worms and Durer makes his lament, Thomas Munzer, who is one of the most important German thinkers I think, of the 16th century, very much ignored uh, in the West, but I think he's incredibly important. Thomas Munzer will identify the Roman Pope and the Holy Roman Empire as the beast, as the monster, as the Antichrist, as the Antiochus War of the Phineas. And he's right about that. See, he actually reads the Apocalypse and Daniel correctly. It can't just be a bishop. It's got to be the rulers, right? And the rulers in Germany during Munster's day are oppressing the peasants and the poor and the weavers and the miners, and they're taking and taking and taking and then punishing the peasants and saying, Thou shalt not steal. Don't you read the commandment? Thou shalt not steal without robbing them blind, right? And 
Luther defends his most holy lords, his most holy princes, his most reverend fathers, etc. And once it's like, you're the Antichrist too. It's not just wrong, it's those princes whose boots you're licking, and it's you. You're all going down. It's amazing, actually. He is like apocalypse on steroids. <laughs> And he's hard to argue with, too. He's got Julia and I were studying in this semester together, and uh, he's, a, he's a tough guy. So, so for him, you see, Luther identified one of the bad guys, but he didn't identify all of them. And, and this is the question that Durer asked, what about Rome? What happens to Rome here? Maximilian I is a Roman emperor. This is against the Roman Empire. <laughs> this isn't a, so, so, so Munzer actually uh, is a very interesting character, and he winds up siding with the peasants when they, when they rebel against the nobles because of the injustice they were experiencing, which nobody argues about it. They were experiencing it. And he thought that when they rose up against the nobles, Christ would, in fact, appear to vindicate them. And so he leads them out in this impossibly ridiculous battle. That, you know, they have their carrying little uh, scythes and bows and stuff, and the nobles are in their horses and bows and arrows and stuff, and he exhorts them out, and the nobles slaughter 150,000 mildly armed peasants. I mean, it is just hard to prove his point, actually. <laughs> the arrogance of the princes is unbelievable, and nobody tries to rise up against nobles in Europe until the French Revolution. That's how effective it was. And once he went to the killed in the process, so, but he actually believed that, that the vindication was at hand, and that by rising up against the and the Church of Rome, you were on the side of the Apocalypse. So you see, the Apocalypse can have its, uh, its downside as well. Within 25 years of these woodcuts, the German city of Munster is told by followers of the couple named Melchior Hoffman that the New Jerusalem is going to show up in their city. Right? So where is the New Jerusalem going to come to? Not in Jerusalem. No, no, in Munster in Germany. <laughs> <laughs> That's okay. When I first started teaching here, it was going to be in Gary. <laughs>
They thought that the people against whom they were writing needed to be destroyed by direct intervention by God. That's how bad they were. Right? And that because these people are here, Luther, the Pope, whomever, you know, because these people are here, it's any minute now. It's any minute now. So, so in a sense, the, 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 these woodcuts are just wonderfully tranquil uh, in terms of their portrayal of the apocalypse, because within 10 years, Germany is going to be a totally different place. It'll be unrecognizable. And were he to do this series, I think, in 1521, 1526, it would, I think there would be different themes showing up there. So, so I hope that that's helpful to see him. I mean, I haven't talked a lot about this per se, because I think they really are, they, once you see what is in there, I think, I think you can also see the beauty of what is there. But I wanted to highlight, actually, I think he actually raises a question by means of these blue cuts that is incredibly significant. And, and of course, all heirs are this to this day. Um, thankfully, I think, most of us are polite enough not to call each other the Antichrist and things like that. But I mean, it does show how serious the problems were. That the people really thought that, that our position, whatever it was, could be as bad as Antiochus Epiphanes or the, or the Roman Empire. Um, so it, it, makes these, it makes these claims quite in, almost impossible to Yeah, the apocalyptic thinking is no compromise thinking. Uh, 
Um, and that's a beauty, but that's also the scary part of it. Uh, but th thank you, thank you for your question. Yes, ma'am. Um, if you have the goal of education, like saying that students in churches, and uh, that you did this format, uh, what is it? And he 
does an, an amazing portrait of Erasmus late in their life, actually, late in his life, late in Erasmus' life. Uh, but he also works with Melanchthon, um, and, and so he's known in Wittenberg, and Melanchthon goes to Nuremberg to see him. So it's really interesting. He seems to be very much associated with the Wittenberg people, but he's also independent. He doesn't want to get sucked into their, I mean, because he, he also likes Erasmus, so he wants to be more independent, but he definitely agrees with that. I mean, so if you had to ask the question, where is the beast in the abyss, or, you know, the horror of Babylon, he would say, it's the seat of Rome. I don't think you have a chance to talk about that. Is that? Yeah, yeah. Chronic, chronic is more of Luther's camp. I mean, he's actually painting in Denver, so, um, but he definitely knows all the horror, and they, and they like the fact that he was an ally, actually. So, yes? I have a slightly cheeky question. Wait, if we... Oh, if you get another question, oh, I'm, I'm sorry, I, mean, I didn't gesture, but just to let everyone have that one first, thank you. Yeah. You mentioned that it, this work helped create the appearance of the Apocalypse, and that's what you were saying about the Apocalypse in Germany at the time. Mm -hmm. Is there any evidence that that spread to any outside of Germany? Oh, yeah, I mean, it's, this is not an uncommon theme in the era, but what, what does seem to sink up in Germany is how intense it is in Germany. Like, you don't get a monster. You don't get a Thomas Munzer in France. Um, and someone like Calvin, for instance, who's my sort of uh, specialty uh, study, he's not very apocalyptic at all. I mean, when you get when he gets to a problem like Second Thessalonians, he'll say, oh yeah, the bishop reforms the Antichrist. But, but he's not thinking the way Luther and even Melanchthon were, that really we're living in the last days, any minute now, it's all going to be over. Um, so it, it, I think culturally, I think Italy is less apocalyptic for sure. Hungary may be a little, Hungary and Poland seem to get some of these currents too, but they come to them from Germany. But Germany is just, it's amazing, actually. <laughs> and, uh, you know, there's this great theologian, Hans Ulf von Balthasar, uh, whose, whose first study was actually in literature, it wasn't in theology, and it was on the idea of the apocalypse from the 18th century to the present, and it's just all over the place. In German theology, in German thought, in German literature. And so it just seems there's something about the apocalypse in Germany, they just go together. And the only other country I can think of like that is here. Um, really, I mean, in America is amazing that way, uh, of the United States. So, so it's a great question, actually. It, it, and, and was this a current in German language things before Durer? Probably, or else they wouldn't have bought the book. But does he accelerate it? Oh, I, I don't think there's any doubt. I mean, as I said, 10 years. <laughs> you know. By 10 years, Luther's already long designated the Pope as the Antichrist by 1521. So, so I think that there's something in the German context, and I think he actually is a major player with regard to that. So, but I can't, you know, I can't prove it. This is sort of looking at the landscape of Europe. They do seem to be the most popular in their thinking. So. Did German Catholic bishops have any comments on the theology that he was expressing? No, actually, I don't. As far as I know, it was a, it was a very
application of endurance if you get this sort of up and start off and do it out yourself. It doesn't seem to have occurred to anybody that that was, you know, a problem. And so, <laughs> but, but, but that's the way empires work. Empires work by selecting. I mean, look at Syria. Bashar al-Assad is going to hold on to power if he's the last person standing there. Screw him. Right? Oh, yeah. Oh, you got men, women, and children hiding in Aleppo? Drop some barrels of uh, shrapnel out of a helicopter, 50-gallon drums, into your own neighborhoods. I mean, that's the way empires work. So if you, if you, and this is one sort of criticism of Luther, if you allow the prince to defend you and exile your, your opponents and censor them and take their works out of the printing press and things like that, you're playing empire. But then Munzer plays the revolution card, and so you would say that's not patient endurance either. The, the disciples of Jesus in the apocalypse are not taking up the sword and offering the princes. Um, I'm not saying that that makes Munzer go away, it just makes him a little more difficult. So, so this question kind of, I mean, this is the question the 16th century poses is what does it mean to be faithful? Right? And Rome has a very, what do you mean, what does it mean to be faithful? Just listen to us. I mean, what's your problem? <laughs> Waiting for God to 
destroy your enemy. Can you really love your enemy? Like Jesus says we're supposed to. You know, it's an interesting question. But, but I think he actually, and they're very dramatic, and it's very dark, it's very, you know, it's just him with a black death. They're a reflection of the book. Yeah, they're a reflection of the book. And they're also a reflection of him. If you look at his artwork, it has a kind of dark tonality. Yes. Yes. And, and some of that's the media, because it's black. And some of that's him. And, and German, I think, actually has that. So it's a good point, though. Yeah. I think, though, when you read Revelation, it's actually worse than this. <laughs> so so he, he actually does more nice images than he could have. Uh, and he done a lot of the tormenting ones, you know, where the people being burned, where smoke rises up before the altar of the Lamb forever. And, yeah. Um, he doesn't do that. <laughs> so, anyway. Other questions? All right. Well, thank you. Thank you so much for your time.